I'm going to read a couple passages out of the 50th Law by 50 Cent and Robert Greene. Uh, 50 Cent's the rapper, you know, don't think I won't hit you because I'm popular. Um, and then Robert Greene, he's a, he's the author of The 48 Laws of Power and also The Art of Seduction. And some other ones. 50 Cent also has some books, too. Uh, 50 by 50, From Pieces to Weight. Um, so, okay. Introduction. So, over you is the greatest enemy a man can have, and that is fear. I know some of you are afraid to listen to the truth. You have been raised on fear and lies, but I'm going to preach to you the truth until you are free of that fear. Malcolm X. In fact, the reality of 21st century America is something more like the following. Our physical environment is safer and more secure than any other moment in our history. We live in the most prosperous country in the world. In the past, only white males could play the power game. Now, millions upon millions of minorities and women have been given entrance to the arena, forever altering the dynamic, making us the most socially advanced country in that regard. Advances in technology have opened up all kinds of new opportunities. Old business models are dissolving, leaving the field wide open for innovation. It is a time of sweeping change and revolution. The fearless type. The very first thing I remember in my early childhood is a flame. A blue flame jumping off a gas stove. Somebody had lit. I was three years old. I felt fear, real fear, for the first time in my life. But I remembered also like some kind of adventure, some kind of weird joy. I guess that experience took me someplace in my head I hadn't been before, to some frontier, the edge, maybe of everything possible. The fear I had was almost like an invitation, a challenge to go forward into something I knew nothing about. That's where I think my personal philosophy of life started with that moment. In my mind, I've always believed and thought that since that motion had to be forward away, from the heat of that flame. Miles Davis. Napoleon Bonaparte represents a classic fearless type. He began his career in the military just as the French Revolution exploded. At this critical moment in his life, he had to experience one of the most chaotic and terrifying periods in history. He faced endless dangers on the battlefield as a new kind of warfare was emerging, and he navigated through innumerable Political intrigues in which one could move, or in which in which one wrong move could lead to the guillotine. He emerged from all this with a fearless spirit, embracing the chaos of the times and the vast changes going on in the art of war. And in one of his innumerable campaigns, he expressed the words that could serve as the model, as the motto for all fearless types. In the spring of 1800. He was preparing to lead an army into Italy. His, fear, his field marshals warned him that the Alps were not passable at that time of year and told him to wait, even though waiting would spoil the chances for success. The general replied to him, For Napoleon's army, there shall be no Alps. And he mounted on a mule. Napoleon proceeded to personally lead his troops through treacherous terrain and past innumerable obstacles. It was the force of one man's will that brought them through the Alps catching the enemy completely by surprise and defeating them. There are no Alps and no obstacles that can stand in the way of a person without fears. Another example of the type would have to be the great abolitionist and writer Frederick Douglass, who was born in, in, into slavery in Maryland in 1817. As he later wrote, slavery was a system that depended on the creation of deep levels of fear. Douglass continually forced himself in the opposite direction. Despite the threat of severe punishment, he secretly taught himself to read and write. When he was whipped for his rebellious attitude, he fought back and saw that he was whipped less often. Without money or connections, he escaped to the North at the age of 20. He became a leading abolitionist, touring the North and telling audiences about the evils of slavery. The abolitionists wanted him to stay on his lecture circuit and repeat the same stories over and over. But Douglas wanted to do much more, and he once again rebelled. He found his own anti-slavery newspaper, an unheard of act for a former slave. The newspaper went on to have tremendous success. 
At each state of, stage of his life, Frederick Douglass was tested by the powerful odds against him. Instead of giving in to the fear of whippings, being alone on the streets of unfamiliar cities, facing the wrath of the abolitionists, he raised his level of boldness and pushed himself further onto the offensive. This confidence gave him the power to rise above the fierce resistances and animosities of those around him. That is the physics that all fearless types discover at some point. An appropriate ratcheting up of self-belief and energy when facing negative or even impossible circumstances. This past, the Negro's past of rope, fire, torture, death, and humiliation, fear by day and night, fear as deep as the marrow of the bone, this past, this endless struggle to achieve and reveal and confirm a human identity, yet contains for all its horror something very beautiful. People who cannot suffer can never grow up can never discover who they are. James Baldwin One of the greatest fears that any child has is that of being abandoned, left alone in a terrifying world. It is the source of our most primal nightmares. This was 50's reality. He never knew his father and his mother was murdered when he was 8 years old. He quickly developed the habit of not depending on other people to protect or shelter him. This meant that in every subsequent encounter in life, in which he felt fear, he could only turn he could turn only to himself. If he did not want to feel the emotion, he had to learn to overcome it on his own. The fiftieth law. The greatest fear people have is that of being themselves. They want to be fifty cent or someone else. They do what everyone else does, even if it doesn't fit where and who they are. But you get nowhere that way. Your energy is weak and no one pays attention to you. You're running away from the one thing that you own, what makes you different. I lost that fear and once I felt the power that I had by showing the world I didn't care about being like other people, I could never go back. In my view, it is better to be impetuous than cautious, because fortune is a woman, and if you wish to dominate her, you must beat her and batter her. It is clear that she will let herself be won by men who are impetuous, rather than by those who step cautiously. Niccolo Machiavelli Another cool thing, they got, they got this... Uh, this little string thing here, you know, it's like, it's like a little little page mark for the, like a, like a little Bible or whatever. Like, I don't know. I think every book actually should have one of these threads. You get in the middle of a book and you have to, you know, find some bookmark and you lose it and you got to keep up with it. This thing is just dangling here, you know, always. So, uh, I agree with, with with whatever that dangly thing is called. The, the Bible string. Yes, I know. Reality is my drug. The more I have of it, the more power I get and the higher I feel. 50 cent. Truth's words apply to you as much as the 50. The greatest danger you face is your mind growing soft and your eye getting dull. When things get tough and you grow tired of the grind, your mind tends to drift into fantasies. You wish things were a certain way and slowly... Subtly, you turn inward to your thoughts and desires. If things are going well, you become complacent, imagining that what you have now will continue forever. You stop paying attention. Before you know it, you end up overwhelmed by the changes going on and the younger people rising up around you, challenging your position. To see this power in action, look at a man like Abraham Lincoln, perhaps our greatest president. He had little formal education and grew up in a harsh frontier environment. As a young man, he liked to take apart machines and put them back together. He was practical to the core. As president, he found himself having to confront the gravest crisis in our history. He was surrounded by cabinet members and advisors who were out to promote themselves or some rigid ideology they believed in. They were emotional and heated. They saw Lincoln as weak. He seemed to take a long time to make a decision and it would often be the opposite of what they had counseled. He trusted generals like Ulysses S. Grant, who was an alcoholic and a social misfit. He worked with those whom his advisors considered 
political enemies on the other side of the aisle. What, what they didn't realize at the time was that Lincoln came to each circumstance without preconceptions. He was determined to measure everything exactly as it was. His choices were made out of pure pragmatism. He was a keen observer of human nature and stuck with Grant because he saw him as the only general capable of effective action. He judged people by results, not friendliness or political values. His careful weighing of people and events was not a weakness, but the height of strength, a fearless quality. And working this way, he carefully guided the country past countless dangers. It is not a history we are accustomed to reading about since we prefer to be swept up in great ideas and dramatic gestures. But the genius of Abraham Lincoln was his ability to focus intensely on reality and see things for what they were. He was a living testament to the power of realism. Know the other, know yourself, and the victory will not be at risk. Know the ground, know the natural conditions, and the victory will be total. Sun Tzu. Ancient Rome began as a small city-state. Its citizens were tough and stoic. They are famous for their pragmatism, but as they moved from being a republic to an empire and their power expanded, everything reversed itself. Their citizens' minds hungered for newer and newer forms of escape. They lost all sense of proportion. Petty political battles consumed their attention more than much larger dangers on the outskirts of the empire. The empire fell well before the invasion of the barbarians. It collapsed from the collective softness of its citizens' minds and the turning of their back on reality. So that's uh, an all current message for America. Since we went from a republic to an empire in 1898, Spanish-American War, when we took over Cuba. Malcolm X was a realist. He had a way of looking at the world that was honed by years on the streets and in prison. After prison, his mission in life was to figure out the source of the problem for blacks in America. As he explained in his autobiography, this country goes in for the surface glossing over. The escape ruse surfaces instead of truly dealing with its deep-rooted problems. He decided to dig as far below the surface as possible. Finally, he arrived at what he believed to be the root cause, dependency. As it stood, African Americans couldn't do things completely on their own. They depended on the government, on liberals, on their leaders, on everybody but themselves. If they could end this dependency, they would have the power to reverse everything. Human nature is so constituted that it cannot honor a helpless man, although it can pity him. And even this it cannot do long if the signs of power do not arise. Frederick Douglass. There are endless problems and dangers confronting the street hustler, undercover cops, fiends, and rival dealers uh, scheming to rob you. If you are weak, you look for others to help you or for some crutch to lean on, such as drugs or alcohol. This was the path of doom. Eventually, your friend would not show up as promised or your mind would be too clouded by drugs to see someone's treachery. The only way to survive was to admit that you were on your own, learn to make your own decisions, and trust your judgment. Do not ask for what you need, but take it. Depend only on your wits. Look at a man like Reuben Hurricane Carter, a successful middleweight boxer who found himself arrested in 1966 at the height of his career and charged with a triple murder. The following year, he was convicted and sentenced to three consecutive life terms. Through it all, Carter vehemently maintained his innocence, and in 1986, he was finally exonerated of the crimes and set free. But for those 19 years, he had to endure one of the most brutal environments known to man, one designed to break down every last vestige of autonomy. Carter knew he would be freed at some point, but on the day of his release, he would walk the streets with a spirit crushed by years in prison. Would he walk the streets with a spirit crushed by years in prison? Would he be the kind of reform or former prisoner who keeps coming back into the system because he can no longer do anything for himself? He decided that he would defeat the system. He would use the years in prison to, to develop his self-reliance so that when he was freed, it would mean something. For this purpose, he devised the following strategy. 
He would act like a free man while surrounded by walls. He would not wear their uniform or carry an ID badge. He was an individual, not a number. He would not eat with the other prisoners, do the assigned task, or go to his parole hearings. He was placed in solitary confinement for these transgressions. But he was not afraid of the punishments, nor being alone. He was afraid, afraid only of losing his dignity and sense of ownership.